But what is the real problem? And this is in some sense where we will be uh, leading our uh, discussion. It's not just what currently is the problem. It's that this problem has been accumulating over time, partly because of how the euro was created itself, partly because in the eurozone itself, many countries that shouldn't have been allowed were uh, allowed. So I've selected uh, three things to make the point. First, uh, the so-called southern rim countries, the, uh, the countries in the southern part of Europe, all are running very large current account uh, deficit. So I've listed here that uh, France for last year had a current account deficit of 82 million uh, euro, billion, excuse me, Spain 32 billion, Portugal 11 billion, and so on. So basically the whole southern rim is uh, not producing and exporting enough to, uh, to be competitive in the global economy, put it that way. On the other side, there is Germany that alone has a budget surplus, current account budget, uh, uh, current account surplus of 170 billion uh, euros. So you basically have a very divided eurozone where you have uh, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, Finland, Sweden outside of the eurozone that have large surpluses. They produce a lot and they export a lot. They're successful globally. And you have the southern European countries that basically export very little and they're not uh, globally um, uh, competitive. Part of the reason is that it's nearly impossible to run, to start a run a business in this country. So I've pointed here uh, one number, which is that if you tomorrow want to establish a very small shop, one person shop in uh, Athens, it would cost you 9,000 euro just to be able to open it. And this excludes industry specific uh, requirements. So just, uh, just to open some sort of a grocery store, let's say, you'd have to put up in various fees 9,000 uh, uh, euro. The comparable amount in Berlin, and Germany is by no uh, stretch of imagination a country without regulation, is about 500 euro. So to give you an, an idea of how different, how mo much more difficult it is to do, um, to do business in uh, Athens, in Cyprus, in Paris, and so on. And the last point, which I think is the most striking and very few people realize it, uh, Anders will speak about this, is the level or the lack of education in some of the southern European countries. One number that I would like you to um, uh, remember, which is that in Portugal, only 38% of the working age population has high school diploma, has finished high schools, 38%. Slightly more than a third of the labor force has high school, not university, high school. The comparable number for Germany is 88%. Uh, in the US, it's something similar, I think about uh, 80 also about uh, that. So with that, I'll very quickly go through the solutions that were proposed and didn't work or were never implemented for one reason or another. First idea sounds great, Euro holidays. This is um, an idea mostly... Um, supported by Martin Feldstein from uh, the NBR. The idea is simple, which is to say, look, some of these countries basically entered the Eurozone and they shouldn't really have been in. So why don't we temporarily send them on a holiday? <clears throat> so if you like, they are suspended for some time. They are suspended from the currency pack to the Euro. Their current currency, roughly speaking, um, uh, devalues to whatever its uh, real value should be. That can take a year, that can take uh, two years. He gives it up to three years. They also do some significant structural reforms that can be negotiated with uh, the European Central Bank and with the European Commission in this period. The period is pre-specified. Uh, and then the ECB and the European Commission guarantees that if these structural reforms are done, then they'll be readmitted. So there is no issue that you're once out and then nobody wants you um, uh, back. So this is roughly the idea to uh, detach from the euro, get a new balance, if you like, in the exchange rate, reattach, but in the meantime, you've done uh, a number of um, reforms. Sounds very uh, logical, but it has a number of... Um, problems, one uh, purely uh, technical problem that then all contracts have to be rewritten from euro to whatever the new currency would be, the new drachma or the new lira or, or, or whatnot. You'd have to rewild the uh, meters and this would take time. It would take at least a year. How do we know that? Because countries that are entering like Estonia, like Latvia, 
have about a year, six, nine months to a year to prepare. Uh, but for them, it's easy because they're entering something that already exists. The currency already exists. The contracts can be future contracts towards uh, the euro. And anyhow, many of the contracts are already in, uh, in euro. So it's easier to enter rather than exit. This is a more difficult uh, uh, thing. Uh, banks will have major problems with the balance sheets, the banks that hold uh, Greek or Italian or Spanish and so on uh, debt. And it would be a huge political problem as well, which I'll discuss at the end, which is that in the current uh, uh, Eurozone contracts, there is actually no exit clause. If a country decides today to exit the Euro, actually there is no legal way to uh, do it. It was purposefully done this way so that the currency looks stable but uh, it didn't help much. Second solution is uh, a variation uh, called the Northern Euro. It's an even simpler idea, basically saying, look, we have two Europes I showed you in the trade data. Southern Europe that's not competitive, Northern Europe that is, if you like, super competitive. So we can do it two ways. Either the Southern countries can exit, but that has issues that I already mentioned, or northern countries can exit. And the easier thing about northern countries exiting is that if you like, it's more believable. So if they're exiting, their currencies are not going to depreciate. So you're not going to have some of the problems on the balance sheets of banks, at least not such uh, large problems. So several people have suggested this, but under the main uh, storyline, you have first a small country or several small northern countries let's say Austria or Finland or the Netherlands uh, exiting. After a while, Germany uh, follows, plus a few other of the uh, austerity hawks, uh, Latvia, Estonia, and so on. And you gradually create uh, Northern Euro, and essentially what is now the Euro becomes the Southern uh, Euro. The Southern Euro then can have its own monetary policy with its own uh, central bank. They can run a more expansionary um, policy, uh, and in that way, if you like, avoid austerity, which is what uh, the southern European countries want to do um, anyhow. There are many issues with this. First, uh, the German exporters wouldn't agree with that because currently they're enjoying some um, competitive advantages from the, um, uh, from the euro. Otherwise, uh, the currency of the northern euro would appreciate and it would be more difficult to export for them. But most import importantly, it's very unlikely that if you just leave the southern European countries, they actually can put together southern European central banks. So they're going to start arguing, and you would end up with a strong northern euro, and then their own currencies, which were before they joined uh, the euro. So the whole then idea of united Europe is going to completely uh, uh, disappear. Third idea, Eurobonds. This is actually still an active idea. Um, with Anders, we have some, uh, we've discussed this uh, a lot. Um, the idea of Eurobonds is very simple, which is to say, look, we have an issue that some countries basically cannot uh, appear on their own in the market. So if they appear, it's very expensive for them. So why don't we, instead of different countries going to the markets on their own, Slovenia, Spain, Germany, and so on, we put it together, so at the Eurozone level, we appear as one country, just like the US can appear as one, uh, uh, one country, even though it's uh, many states. And then we have one joint Eurozone, uh, Eurozone uh, bond. Uh, that would reduce the cost, many people argue, of the bonds. And we have some estimates of how much it would, uh, it would reduce the bonds. This estimate suggests that Italy, for example, a country that's currently experiencing problems, would save up to 4% of its GDP annually if it can benefit from this, uh, from this um, euro bond. And currently, this is a live topic. In fact, it has been uh, throughout uh, the crisis. I'm almost done. What are the problems? There are a number of technical problems. I'm not going to go through them. So just look at the last thing. The main problem is that Merkel doesn't agree. Not only she doesn't agree, but she has this great quote at the party congress of the junior party in her government, where they ask her, what do you think about the Eurobond? And she says, uh, no to the Eurobond as long as I live. And then the party claps and says, uh, we wish you a long life. Uh, so basically, the Germans are not at all even considering that uh, idea. It's not only the Germans, but the Dutch and uh, 
fins and so on, because they make the argument the moment we have this pooling mechanism, it's like pooling risk. So there are some very risky countries and some countries like the Northern European that are not risky. <clears throat> so we are saving the Southern European countries uh, by reducing their interest rates. What are they going to do? They're going to borrow and borrow and borrow and borrow. So we are just going to deepen the, the crisis. And last point, uh, which is an overall devaluation or an internal devaluation. This is a point that a number of uh, American uh, economists, Paul Krugman, uh, who Ian mentioned, have been making that the ultimate issue, this is the bumblebee discussion <coughs> that we are facing, is that the Southern European countries were actually not competitive to begin with in joining the euro, but they joined it and now they are stuck. They are not competitive enough to produce. So even if we somehow manage to get rid of their uh, debt, which is, uh, which is difficult to imagine uh, how, in another few years, they're going to have yet another crisis, simply because they are not competitive in the confines of, um, of the euro. So what do you do? Well, you can either devalue the whole euro, which was Krugman's original idea, which actually doesn't help anything, even he realized at some point. Why? Well, because that would make Germany even more competitive internationally. So Germany suddenly will even surpass uh, uh, China in terms of uh, current account uh, surpluses, which it actually did in 2011 uh, uh, once. But it's not going to help the intra-Eurozone uh, problems because Portugal is going to be as uncompetitive relative to Germany as it is now. So now there is another idea which is called the internal uh, devaluation, which is basically within the confines of the euro, the southern Europeans uh, should somehow devalue. How does this happen? A long story, but the short version of it is, if Germany agrees to run a larger inflation than they're currently running and larger than southern Europe. Here I haven't found a nice quote from uh, Merkel, but it would be something like this, you know, this is never going to happen as long as I live and my uh, daughter lives and her son lives and uh, so on. So basically that idea of the devaluation, either external or internal, is also not, uh, not going anywhere. So I went through all the things that were thought over the last four years and then that nothing actually works. So you're starting to wonder, well, what did you actually do for four years? Well, there are a number of other discussions and I'll finish with that in my last two uh, Slides were actually, first, it took a long time to even work on the topic. I mentioned that the first two or three years, people were just trying to avoid the main topic for discussion. By 2011, 2012, you couldn't avoid it because it was clear that Europe was getting deeper into, and deeper into uh, trouble. So we started thinking of, of uh, how to resolve it. But even then, very few people, politicians in not just finance ministers, realize which is the bigger problem. It's not just that some countries now have uh, very large deficits and debt. The bigger problem is that you have very low levels of education in some of these countries, that they're not competitive to produce and to export, and that regulation for business is just too burdensome. So you wouldn't even think of starting a business in some of the, in Greece or in some of the sectors of these countries. You need to address these issues. But this is a long-term agenda. How can you put together some uh, short-term agenda? So last two slides. First, uh, the short-term uh, agenda. I already mentioned the uh, regulatory things that you can do, and actually some of these countries are starting to do. Ian mentioned, mentioned the doing business team of the World Bank. It actually is working now in Greece with the Greek government to reduce um, barriers to entry of firms, uh, reduce uh, tax regulations, reduce uh, regulations uh, in the labor market, and uh, so on. Spain is doing the same, Portugal is doing the same. But the Eurozone has two issues, which are, the, uh, which are on this slide, which is that I mentioned one. It actually has no exit. Legally, if you want to exit, you cannot. And this is supposed to be for stability. But anybody who's been in business knows that ultimately an orderly exit through bankruptcy, insolvency, through some rules is much better than chaotic exit, which happens if you don't have any rules. An example of that is Cyprus more recently. So you need to have some rules on exit of the Eurozone. From the European Union, you have actually a rule. Eurozone, no rule. You cannot uh, uh, do it. In ECOFIN, we, of course, very informally in the dark have discussed this idea. 
and gradually come to the realization, uh, the countries that need to come to the realization that yes, it's actually a good idea to have exit. We just need to wait for this crisis to subside. <clears throat> so it's clear that that solution is for the future. It's not now, because if you announce it right now, then markets start thinking somebody is exiting, who is it? And then they start attacking that. But the idea of an exit that is written in the rules is something that is gradually starting to be agreed.